Hello, I'm Wendy Liebman, CEO and Chief Shopper at WSL Strategic Retail, and this is Future Shop. This is where I talk to innovators, disruptors, and iconoclasts about the future of retail. Today, my guest is Alec Gourlay. Alec is the executive chair of Holland and Barrett, the UK's leading wellness retailer and one of the largest in Europe. He'll tell you more about the company when I let him get a chance to speak. Um, he was formerly executive vice president and co-chief operating officer of Walgreens Boots Alliance and president of Walgreens. Many of you will remember him in that role. He was also before that, when I first got to meet him, CEO of Boots, the iconic UK and Ireland based retailer. And as important with all that, he is also a pharmacist. So welcome, Alec, and happy new year. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, happy new year to you and to all of the viewers as well. Thank you. It's great to have you here and, and actually quite a luxury since I only saw you a couple of weeks ago in New York when we were all here to honor 90 years of community pharmacy and NACDS and it was a, a great gathering. So I feel quite lucky that we've had a chance to celebrate and have coffee and all of the above and here we are again. So thanks for joining me. Um, you know, you have a an incredibly um, unique and valuable perspective on retail healthcare, based on your experience all around the world, really, um, but certainly with two now three iconic uh, retail healthcare companies, and and I I was really struck by that because as we look at where healthcare is going around the world and especially in the US, uh, I thought your view would be so valuable here. The other thing that struck me is you and I have had a continuing um, conversation over the years about this notion of retail as a magic box based on some work that we did a number of years ago, some research we did um, about building my magic box. Uh, and so those two things came together in my mind as I really thought about where retail healthcare is going and what a magic box of retail healthcare might actually look like. So anyway, after that long intro, welcome again. Um, it, you know, I thought it'd be really helpful. There are people on this who will be viewing and listening who actually don't know Holland and Barrett. So can you just take a minute and tell us a bit more about the company and and why it's so unique in this in this world? Sure, Wendy. And Holland and Barrett is 154 years old. So again, a very historic company, uh, and uh, companies and brands like Holland and Barrett don't survive for all that time without having something really important to their core. And what has been at the core of Holland and Barrett throughout all of that time is healthy food. In fact, just as a bit of an uh, interesting fact, uh, there was Holland and Barrett, and there was a, a Mr. Ryder. And Mr. Ryder, uh, uh, who was the third partner of the company back in 1920, halfway through the, almost halfway through his existence, is the same Mr. Ryder who created the Ryder Cup. Because he believed that healthy food, seeds and uh, fruits and raisins, gave better performance in sport, and particularly his sport, which was golf. So uh, the core of our company, Holland and Barrett, is health, wellness, and food. And mm -hmm. it's been the same all the way through. And of course, you can take it in different forms, you know, vitamins and supplements and minerals uh, and, uh, and inside food itself. But that really is the core of Holland and Barrett. And it's, in the UK, it's 720 locations. Mm -hmm. So every high street in the UK, more or less. We have about uh, 80 locations now in Ireland. And we have a couple hundred locations actually in Holland and Belgium. So that's the core of the business. But we also operate in about 13 other countries through either franchising or through wholesaling, including China, uh, including India, uh, and including uh, you know uh, many Middle East countries as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, I would say international, not global. Two thirds of our business is based in the UK, the core part of the business. Yeah. Uh, and um, 
yeah, that's the whole Nabarat today. Yeah. Uh, it really is. Uh, uh, that's the shape of it, and that's the hist- a bit of the history of it. Yeah. The, the thing that's always intrigued me about the company over the years, as I've observed it in my travels, um, was this connection, this broader connection to, as uh, Colin Lindholz from Kroger would call it, food as medicine, and that um, very strong focus around, as you said, not just uh, vitamins and minerals, but but grains, you know, all the things that can, can provide a, a more holistic view to healthcare. And it feels, it felt very contemporary then. I didn't know the Ryder Cup story, uh, but very contemporary then. It certainly feels very contemporary now. So, you know, from your perspective, when you think back to pharma, young pharmacist at Boots and then traveled and worked around the world, what surprised you most about the changes in retail healthcare since your days at Boots, both, you know, in the UK and the US and other parts of the world? I would say the thing that surprised me the most is the lack of change Hmm. in the consumer's mind about the importance of healthcare and the importance of trust and relationship in healthcare. So as a young pharmacist, the thing that I enjoyed even more than the commercial aspects, which I also found fun as well, was that relationship with the local community who came to that pharmacy for advice on many different things, not just uh, medication, but in many aspects of their of their wellness. And uh, and the more that you build a relationship, a personal relationship, either as a pharmacist or as a, an assistant to the pharmacist or as a healthcare assistant, the more they feel welcome and the more they come back and the more they take the advice. And while the world, the products available and uh, what works and what doesn't work and uh, technology, of course, and data really has changed a lot in many aspects of how people see healthcare, the one thing that hasn't changed is that local relationship, that community-based relationship. You know, that's so um, powerful in the way you describe that because, uh, you know, sometimes... I think we forget, and and particularly in this country, and I won't get into medical reimbursement and prescription reimbursement and all of those issues, although we could, no doubt, because you've lived through that on this side of the the world too, that that value of that personal interaction. um, And then as drugstores and other retailers with pharmacies have really looked at issues around profitability and speed of delivery in terms of um, recommendation and how many prescriptions they're filling and all of that. You know, we talk a lot about the value of the pharmacist here, and yet the pharmacist seems to be just so buried in other things. So you reminded me of and I'm sure many others, of why that relationship is is so important. Um, and that hasn't changed or shouldn't change if we want to understand healthcare. The other thing I thought was interesting that you just said is people haven't changed in their needs. And, and I certainly would agree with that. One thing we're seeing here is how people, there is um, an increasing concern about trust in healthcare delivery or accessibility and trust. And um, and so people wanting to take greater control of their own health and wellness, we see that in all our own research. And I wonder how you're seeing that when you think about Holland and Barrett and how you're enabling people to be more proactive about their health. Yeah, I think this these are trends that we see for sure. Mm-hmm. In Holland and Barrett, and we see in the UK and in Europe as well as I saw in America because I was through, mm-hmm. uh, I, I walked through the pandemic in America uh, mm-hmm. with Walgreens, um, and of course the pandemic has exaggerated and accelerated these trends. Uh, and I think there's a couple of very simple reasons for it. I think first of all, uh, the fragility of human life. Mm-hmm. We are on this planet for a limited period of time. Uh, and everyone saw that close up during the, you know, the pandemic. It was mm-hmm. you know, when you think back to these very dark days, in my view, uh, when this this scary, scary virus was around the place. There was real tragedy. There was real human loss, and I think everyone observed that uh, in in different ways, either very close 
or 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 if, if they were forced enough, maybe at a distance. And therefore, I think psychologically, people decided that they wanted to take even more control of their precious lives uh, and wanted to understand more about the data uh, and the personalization of that data that supports their lives. Uh, and you see it uh, in so many different ways. But the, 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 the way that I think we see it the most today is in the younger generations, if I could say that. You know, where it's quite funny and anecdotally, you know, when you think of how when I went to university, how I, how I used to live my life, it was a bit of alcohol. I didn't smoke. I've got it. I didn't smoke a bit of alcohol and some pretty fast food mm-hmm. uh, and some, you know, and some and some relatively heavy living uh, for me anyway, probably quite lightweight for many others, but for me, quite heavy living <laughs> compared to today where a lot of a lot of uh, university students, uh, you know, they're, they're now counting the steps. They're now counting the protein that goes in the body, they're now staying fit, they're not touching alcohol, and they're certainly very, very unfavorable in the main to processed foods. It's really quite a shift in behavior of a generation that's going to be earning and generating the most value and wealth in the next 20, 30, 40 years, Mm -hmm. uh, just seem to be much more aware and taking much better care of themselves at a very personal level. That's probably the biggest shift that's coming, I think. Yeah. For, for for all of us in the future. And how do you see that reflected when you you know walk into your stores um, and in a lot of the technology that you're beginning to build in terms of personalization? How are you thinking about that um, as you build and and support that younger generation? So again, you go back to the maybe a couple of themes. The first theme we've touched on already, which is People still want to have a level of human interaction with an expert or someone with knowledge uh, because it gives them the reassurance that they're getting the best solution. The second part is they're much more aware. They no longer rely on the general practitioner, the doctor or the specialist. They rely very much on you know the search engines, uh, the Googles of this world and uh, et cetera. Uh, and all of the experts, all the influencers are online. So you put these two things together, and you get you know the 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 the, the combination of these two things. And I think that's where the majority of that younger generation are at. You know they'll do their work. They'll come in as really quite knowledgeable, sometimes very knowledgeable. Mm-hmm. And our job in our new magic box is to make sure that we can add value to their knowledge. Mm-hmm. Uh, and really help them to make even better choices or confirm the choice they're making is the best for them. Yeah. It's interesting because I know in our How America Shops research that you're familiar with that um, the, the, the number of places we see people going to do their homework for information around health and wellness is just extraordinary. When we think about how people are busy, short of time, you know, all of these things, um, it is extraordinary to see, you know, the number of places they go and the time they spend, to your point, doing due diligence. Um, Yes, especially younger because they are so tech savvy and enabled. Um, But also, as you said, you know, during the pandemic where people had to do more virtual consultations and um, even, you know, older generations now who have become more facile with with, um, using technology, that they are so much more informed. So that's an interesting relationship. How do you add value at a re- in a retail space, not just assume you're the you know the only uh, expert in the room. Yeah, and it goes back to I think that the way you add value is by having data and technology uh, that is uh, able to really say add value, you know, to to the conversation, so that you know you <laughs> excuse this. It's probably an English phrase or a British phrase. Know your onions. You got to know you got to know your stuff. You know, there's no you know as soon as soon as someone demonstrates a lack of understanding, a lack of care, mm-hmm. a lack of knowledge, then the customer switched off. And yeah. The relationship yeah. is broken very quickly. Yeah. So you see, I mean, there's so much. I'm sitting here with my Apple Watch on. Um, you know, the the technology, the wearables, the ability to engage and personalize at least my yeah. stand up, sit down, walk around, do all those sort of things. Uh, how do you see 
some of these new wearable technologies informing not only healthcare, but also how you go to do business in a, you know, in a retail, physical retail space in the future? So I, th I think the, the core to this is if people trust you, they'll give you more information. So whether that be, a li be lifestyle information or whether that be DNA information, which, uh, you know, again, post the pandemic, everyone, everyone's DNA is locked away somewhere <laughs> because we've all had a PCR test uh, or a blood test. So, uh, so I think you take all of the, the information uh, and with a trusted environment, you create, you know, personal solutions with the best in breed solutions. And that's the, the opportunity, I think, inside the magic box is that you have the relationship, the person gives you their data in an appropriate form, and then using technology, you're able to really, through personal navigation, that maybe a digital navigation and personal navigation, you're able to direct people to exactly the one, two or three things that they can do to really improve the quality of their life. Yeah. Uh, the, the idea of uh, longevity, I think, has moved on. It really is now about adding quality years to life. So living a fuller life, both physically and mentally, for longer. Yeah. I think that's a big deal. Uh, yeah, forward. I remark on that so often. I, You know, reading the paper, digitally or physically, and reading the obits, excuse the expression, you get to yeah. a certain age um, and you want to see who's hanging around or not. And I'm amazed at the people who are 90, 100, whatever, or the people who in their 60s and 70s are engaged in, in, in new lifestyles, life, you know, activities, all of that. Uh, and so that that issue and opportunity around longevity is something that I think we talk a lot about younger consumers, younger patients, whatever, but also how do we help people in their 60s, 70s, 80s continue um, to live, as you said, a, a, you know, a productive and healthy life? That seems like such a massive, wonderful opportunity at both ends of the scale or at all ends of the scale. Um, how do you think about that in a retail environment it's something you know with the holland and barrett or boots or walgreens whatever um even a grocery store you know and in whomever when we think about that is there a one-size-fits-all environment for that and data helps personalize the conversation is how, how do you how do you think about all of that i think that's true i think there is a, a one-size-fits-all but uh the model is probably a combination of off and online because you need authority as well. You need a range of solutions. Uh, because as you said before, the things that influence the due diligence that you talked about is, is varied. So people come in informed with very specific areas of interest and maybe specific brands or specific solutions. So you, you got to be able to have real authority in products and solutions including the best of breed. So whether it be sleep or whether it be uh, energy or whether it be, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, diet, food as medicine, all, all immunity, all these areas are, are there. So I think you, you, inside the magic box, you've got to be able to provide both uh, clarity to the right solution through, through de demystifying the data they bring and the information they have mm -hmm. to the solution that's personalized to them, along with authority. You know, it's almost that authority piece as well. So it's a very specialized model in yeah. reality, and I think, yeah. to do this well. I don't think a general. I think a journalist can make a good job of it. But I think people are looking beyond the journalists, mm -hmm. in my view, yeah. to more specialist models. That's the thing that's really interesting to me, particularly as I look at the U.S. now, and I think about, you know, here we are, we always... Every so often we go through this thing of too many stores, right? Too many department stores, too many drug stores, too many whatever. And especially as, as digital and e-commerce in its more specific shopping form has grown so much. Uh, and I do wonder about that because I think about the, the drug store as a channel as being both healthcare at the back, if you get to the pharmacy, the OTCs, whatever, but convenience at the front. And I'm at this point where much to the conversation or the point you just raised about 
does it really now have to hone its message, the drug store down in the US, to being a specialty place for health and wellness and not a place where you forget the dog food and you run in at the last minute? I mean, what's your what's your perspective on that? You have a unique view to all of that. I mean, I don't think it's a surprise if I said it's not working the way it is today. You know, I think that's very evident from yeah. uh, from what we know. Uh, you know Footfall is dropping rapidly at a time when post post a pandemic and post uh, the level of interest we've spoken about in wellness. Mm-hmm. You know, that the, you would think that the interest would be would be increasing. So um, I, I do really strongly believe that the strategies that CVS and Walgreens are pursuing to become the local healthcare and wellness providers mm. are the right strategies. Mm. But it takes time. It takes yeah. time, you know, in different ways yeah. uh, to get to that position. And, yeah, uh, it's, it's a hard ask, right, when you think yeah. about it, you know, when so much of the, when we think about the front store issues as well as the, the pharmacy issues, one of the greatest frustrations we hear from uh consumers when they shop in particularly in drugstores but in general is that you know they they really do see what you said about the trust of the pharmacist but the pharmacist is so busy doing other things that they never get to talk to them and of course vaccinations added to that list of chores so it's not that they don't value the pharmacist it's that they don't get to see the pharmacist i've always thought um, you and I probably had this conversation that if somebody moved the pharmacy right to the front of the store, it would be a really good thing. Um, and that to me will be the sign of change in the US. Uh, but yeah, there's, there are a lot of other issues. Do you see, you've often talked about green shoots. I love the optimism of that, even though things are slow. Are you seeing green shoots in this, particularly in the US? I think it's a little different in Europe, but green shoots of this emerging um, in the US when you think about healthcare and pharmacy and all the related areas of delivery? Yes, I, I do. I think that uh, if, you, if you think who's going to solve the, the need for the customer, this, this need for uh, more personalised information that keeps them healthier for longer, wellness, whatever, whatever way you don't describe it, you know, if you take the wellness side of the coin rather than the illness side of the coin, then I think that um, the government's not going to do it <laughs> because they, they, they're too busy dealing with the, the problem of illness. Yeah. Charities can't do it because, again, they're picking up the pieces where the government, you know, the gaps where people fall through, unfortunately, in every society, and the US is certainly no, no different. So it's got to be done by a commercial company. So a commercial company like, you know, like a integrated insurer retailer like CVS or a United Health and Optum or, you know, Walgreens uh, with Village MD, uh, uh, you know, the, the, these, these more integrated models are the places where the commercial businesses can provide that customer need because there's a huge customer need. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there's a huge economic need. Again, if you look at the U.S., I'm going to get this number slightly wrong because I'm probably a bit out of date, but 20% of the GDP roughly mm-hmm. is spent on illness. Yeah. There's very little spent on wellness. Yeah. What an opportunity. And people are very willing to spend their dollar for, you know, as you said, they search mm-hmm. everywhere. If someone can just put it all together for them in, yeah. a, in a way that really is, is uh, relationship-based and personalized. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I... I I see green shoots. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's very hard because mm-hmm. change is enormously difficult, particularly when you find a successful model. But you know, CVS are what three, four, five years into the integra- into their model mm-hmm. with Edna, yeah, uh, yeah, and Caremark longer, yeah. Yeah. and uh, Walgreens is a couple of years into its its work with Village MD and its healthcare strategy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you know, Cygnus. Doing an, I mean, they're, they're all coming through Amazon, you know. Right. Again, another great yeah. example of, of true integration. So I think yeah. the green shoots are there. They're not, they're not oak trees yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it is the other thing it, it's, uh, that's intriguing to me, and it's you see it a lot in New York City, which 
of course, is not necessarily typical, but you also increasingly see it around the country, is these storefront specialty formats, whether it's Forward, which is, you know, a subscription service to take care of your health, your family's health. You sign up for a monthly fee and it gives you access, as you probably know, to doctors and medical yeah. care. There's um, a service called Dental, which is another D A D N T L or some weird spelling that's, again, oral care services, um, street front, easily accessible. I mean, everything from um, acupuncture. I mean, it's really amazing to see these individual street fertility um, yeah. clinics, yeah. all of that, and then specialized, like um, there's, a, there's a retailer here called TIA, which is women's healthcare, a broad range of services from OBGYN, her MD. So these sort of specialty formats that are building out with both service and to some degree product but technology very personalized. And that to me is quite exciting um, to see that. It certainly talks to the need, as you said, and especially around younger consumers um, as well. And, and people who are caregivers, which is again, the other huge opportunity. Yeah. Um, are you seeing a lot of those kind of specialty formats in the UK or Ireland or Europe as you, or China as you look around the, as you look around the world? Yes, yes, but not to the same extent as the US, I would say. I think the incentives are slightly different in, 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 in the, the sort of the, you know, the government driven models in Europe compared to mm -hmm. the, the sort of half and half model, I would guess. Right. Uh, that you get in, uh, you know, where there's real incentives, I think, in the commercial, uh, the commercial models to, mm -hmm. to lower costs and keep people out of secondary care. So, 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 yes, yes, and yes. But what I, what I don't sense yet in America either is someone meeting that 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 that, that customer need in in a really coherent way. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting. I was reading uh, an article the other day about the development of marketplaces, digital marketplaces, right? Uh, and you know how they've developed in holidays or in clothing or in uh, in, in many sectors in reality. To, to the extent they are, they are now a major part of the, the go-to market models. But it's not yet happening in healthcare, this yeah. idea of a healthcare marketplace, a digital and physical. And, yeah. and I think, again, uh, I think it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an open opportunity to take these very narrow but very important subjects like oral health or sleep or... Mm -hmm. Healthy eating, and and then create really this uh, this authority in wellness. Yeah, it's, you just reminded me one of the best health retailers, holistic ones that I have seen recently is actually Petco, the uh, pet store, yeah. and they have opened a, a new little flagship, not so little, um, in uh, Greenwich Village here on Union Square, and it's just everything that you could possibly want from the door when you look in the window they're grooming the dogs to specialty food to a vet to toys and every every animal you could imagine everybody works there has to have a pet so to your point about trust and engagement um and i marvel at it i think why can we not have this marketplace if you will um or physical representation for me why does it have to be just for my pet um, so it's a, it's, it's, I looked at it the other day and actually on the front of the store, it says Petco health and wellness store, I think. And I'm like, okay, all right, I could do that anyway. Um, so as we riff on, uh, the magic box of health in the future, you've raised a number of issues and, and opportunities there. I mean, are there one or two things when you walk into Holland and Barrett and we'll share some images because I think it, you know, again, a picture. A picture, uh, whatever, tells a thousand words or something, or it's better than a thousand words. Um, when you walk into Holland Bat and Barrett today, um, as you think about it, what's what? Do, what do you see as the big trends for the future in in that operation? Where's the opportunity that you see for the future? So I think uh, I'll, I'll go back to where I started, which I know is will sound a bit. Maybe a bit boring, even uh, is about the quality of people mm -hmm. and, and 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 who they are and what they represent and what they know. 
uh, uh, enabled by great technology, enabled by great technology, uh, which is powered, of course, by by access to data that's in the right shape, in the right form to health, and whether it be about the product or whether it be about the person that you're trying to care for. Um, I think, secondly, it really is about uh, showing showing authority and expertise in the subject matters which are core to wellness. In our case, we talk about conditions. Mm -hmm. So we speak about, you know, you know, we speak about immunity or we speak about joint bones and muscles. Right now, uh, you know, we're speaking about gut health mm -hmm. and we'll speak about women's health and we'll speak about men's health. So really conditions and benefits led, not, not ingredient so much, mm -hmm. uh, not even category led, but much more about, you know, the condition or the benefit from the solution that you're looking for. And I think that's also linked into this idea of authority. Uh, when we speak to Holland and Barry customers, UK customers effectively, about c consideration from Holland and Barry, it jumps, you know, uh, when we speak about conditions compared to when we speak about categories. It's very obvious in the data, but we have to do, do it that way. I think also there has to be a simplicity uh, to the store, because if you're already coming in confused from all of the inputs you've had online mm -hmm. <laughs> about what's best for you, what works for you, there's got to be a clarity. Even in a small store, ours, are, you know, our average store is a hundred, what you know, one thousand, one thousand five hundred square square feet. It's, they're small stores, which gives a lot of flexibility in terms of cost, of course, which allows you to put more into the people, more into the products, and more into the supply chain. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a, a cut through. You can't have rows upon rows upon rows of bottles of potions and lotions and cures. There's, there's got to be a clarity to it, which we're not there yet with, but we've got to get at that clarity, I think. And I think last but not least, um, there's got to be um, a recognition, I think, that healthcare is for all, wellness is for all. So rich and poor. Uh, young and old, uh, you know, whatever your gender is, <laughs> whatever your background is, it's got to feel for, it's got to, when you go in there, we've got to recognize you, who you are, what you represent, what's important to you. So there's a localization, of course, within that context of what's there. There's also a stylistic approach that's comfortable and warm and in the wellness side of healthcare, not the illness side. Well, that sounds like a magic box to me. I'm already wanting to be there. So I love that vision. It is, um, it is interesting to imagine how 15,000 square foot or 10,000 square foot drugstores in the U.S. refine themselves to that. But that seems very true to what shoppers and consumers, caregivers, patients are looking for, just people are looking for, to your point about taking greater control in this post-pandemic time. So thank you for sharing your vision of a healthcare magic box. I knew it would be hugely valuable to our audience. And as always, great to see you. And hopefully I'll get to see you there sooner than later, which would be excellent. So thank You're you for welcome. that. You're always Thank welcome, Wendy. If any, anyone wants to visit a home in Barrett, uh, obviously we're very happy to to uh, show them the work. We're, we're work in progress, yeah. but hey, we've been work in progress for 154 years. Because well, that's the great thing about retail and customer focus. You're always work in progress. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But the essence of it is the same. So yeah. um, really appreciate that. Thank you, Alec. Uh, happy, healthy, and everything for 2024 and look forward to seeing you in the future, soon. Thank you, Wendy, and same to all, all the listeners. Thank you. Right. Take care. You know, what Alex said is, is really everything's changed and nothing's changed. The essence of the relationship with the pharmacist, that massive challenge that we seem to face in the U.S., but the ability to develop solutions for uh, shoppers, patients, caregivers in ways that make this place, this healthcare magic box, usable, relatable, um, addressing issues that they are concerned about and having the professional advice both through personalization and technology, but laying on of hands, 
the people in the stores, the physical stores, who can help deliver on those solutions. He talked about not more and more stuff, and we hear a lot from retailers about simplifying to amplify, but it is a very holistic story of how we deliver healthcare in this next few years in a way that's really meaningful to shoppers and that we don't lose this extraordinary opportunity with a proactive younger generation who are looking uh, for solutions and advocating for themselves and older consumers, shoppers who are really focused on living their best life, providing we can make it affordable, accessible to them. So huge amount of opportunity here and around the world, but especially here to get it right soon. So we look forward to continuing to follow that journey in the future. See you then. Cheers for now.